The reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 to 30. Matthew chapter 19, starting at verse 13. Then the children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them, and went away. And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honour your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbour as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers or sisters, or father or mother, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Good morning. Thank you very much, Christine, for reading. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for this section of your word. We pray that as we study it now, that as you speak, you would help us not just to understand, but to accept, to receive, to take to heart. And we ask in Jesus name. Amen. I wonder if you've ever done any of the following things. At our all age service at Browncourt College this morning, we'll be asking people to stand up if they've ever done any of these things. Feel free to do that at home, but you might prefer just to sit comfortably on your sofa. Have you ever come first in a race? Any athletes out there? Have you ever stood for election and won, been elected? Ever won a competition you've entered or won a prize for something? Have you ever been treated as a VIP, as a very important person? Or have you ever come last in a race? Or stood for election and not been elected? Ever entered a competition and lost? Have you ever failed a test or exam at school or at work? Or ever been refused entry somewhere? My guess is most of us will have had both sorts of experiences, in my case, particularly the latter sort, which means we find what Jesus says in the last verse of this morning's Bible passage pretty surprising. He says, but many who are first will be last and the last first. But many who are first will be last and the last first. 
What does he mean by that? And how does it affect us? One of the things I suggested in our planning meeting for the service at Brownkirk College was an activity where the team who were last to finish an activity won a prize for it. Helen, our youth and children's work coordinator, widely dissuaded me from it. You'll have a riot, she said. Uh, maybe she wasn't just talking about the children. We're used to, if you come first, you win. And, and whatever you win, uh, the prize, the award, the step up, well, you've earned it and deserved it. And if you come last, well, sorry, there's no prize for you, no award for you. You stay where you are. You don't proceed. But in this passage and the two that follow it that we'll be looking at in the next two weeks, we see that in the kingdom of heaven, things are very different. This morning, we look at two encounters with Jesus and his explanations to his disciples of what was happening in those encounters. In this section, a number of different phrases are used that mean virtually the same things. So a man comes to Jesus in verse 16 and asks, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And after the man has gone away, Jesus says to his disciples, verse 23, Truly I say to you, only will with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. So enter the kingdom of heaven there means virtually the same thing as have eternal life. As does the slight variation in verse 14, where Jesus says of the little children, to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. When the disciples hear what Jesus says, they ask in verse 25, who then can be saved? Again, it's the same thing. Now, for the sake of clarity, we're going to use the phrase eternal life because that's what the man who comes to Jesus asks him. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? We've got two headings to help us this morning. Here's the first. You can't earn eternal life. The question that the man asks, see, uh, the, he asks Jesus, seems on the surface to be a pretty good question to be asking. What good deed must I do to have eternal life? I mean, that that's good, isn't it? It's a good question to ask, we think. There's a spiritual keenness there. But notice where the man's focus is. It, it's all on himself, isn't it? What good deed must I do to have eternal life? So he's clearly recognised something about Jesus and he wants to hear from Jesus what he needs to do himself to have eternal life. Jesus replies to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good, that is only God. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. There you go. You want to do a good deed to have eternal life? Keep the commandments. Verse 18, he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honour your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Jesus gives a number of the so-called Ten Commandments. And then this last one, you shall love your neighbour as yourself, that is given as a summary statement for the commandments on how we should treat others. Now, quite why Jesus gives these commandments, well, that's probably for another time. If the man had been there when Jesus taught on the commandments, he'd have been given significant pause for thought. Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 21, he says this, "'You have heard that it was said to those of old, "'You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brothers will be liable to judgment. So to obey that commandment, it isn't enough not to have killed someone. That's just the outward form. There needs to have been a freedom from anger as well. By that standard, could any of us really say that we kept that commandment or, or indeed any of the other commandments that Jesus gives? But the young man in Matthew 19 has confidence in himself. All these I've kept, he says. What do I still lack? 
Well, he suspects that there is something lacking. Remember his question as he come to Jesus. What good deed must I do to have eternal life? Verse 21, Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Jesus told the young man that one of the commandments he needed to keep was love your neighbour as yourself. All these I've kept, the young man told him. Really? Jesus pinpoints that that just isn't the case. He hasn't loved his neighbour as himself. Instead, he's hoarded his possessions. So when Jesus tells him to sell his possessions and give to the poor, he isn't able to do it. Verse 22, when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He couldn't do it. He'd come to Jesus with high expectations of a good deed that he could do that would seal eternal life for him. But Jesus has blown his self-confidence apart. In telling him to, to sell his possessions, Jesus didn't pick any old thing. He picked what for the young man was the big thing. If you came to Jesus with the question, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Maybe for you it'd be the same thing that he tells you to do. Maybe it'd be something different. To show you that you are far from perfect. And that you cannot earn eternal life. It can't be done. Your own goodness or religiousness can't win you a place in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus shows how ridiculous the man's self-confidence is. Because in truth, we fall far, far short of God's perfect standards. Jesus says to the man, if you would be perfect, if that's what you're trying to base your confidence on. Well, let me show you how far short of perfect you fall. Verse 23. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich man, rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the, through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, personally, I find it pretty difficult to get a thread through the eye of a needle. A camel? It's impossible. And that's the point. Jesus is saying that it's impossible for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God, which might make several of us stop and think. And it comes as a huge shock to the disciples. They would have understood riches as indicating the blessing of God. If anyone was going to enter the kingdom of God, it was the rich who God had so obviously blessed. So when the disciples hear what Jesus say, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? If the rich can't be saved, then who can? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. We'll see in our second point how this is possible. But we need to see that with man, this is impossible. Eternal life, salvation, enter into the kingdom of heaven. They are impossible by human effort. You can't earn eternal life. It can't be done. Your own moral deeds, your own goodness or religious observances don't cut it. They don't earn you eternal life and they can't earn you eternal life. Those who come to God, confident in what they've done, will be sorely disappointed. Many who are first will be last, says Jesus. You can't earn eternal life. That's our first point. This is our second point. You can receive eternal life. Who then can be saved? That's what the disciples asked Jesus, but actually they should have known. Jesus had already told them. Just before the rich young man had come to Jesus, there had been those that the disciples had tried to shoo away as not being important enough to take up Jesus' time. Verse 13 
Then children were brought to Jesus that he may lay, might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Who can be saved? Who can enter the kingdom of heaven? To such belongs the kingdom of heaven. To such as these, to ones like children, belongs the, the kingdom of heaven. Jesus isn't saying here that only under 18s are in the kingdom of heaven. He's saying that it's those who come to him like little children that the kingdom of heaven belongs to. There's such a contrast with the rich young man. He was trying to impress Jesus with his deeds. The children just wanted to come to Jesus. Now, this isn't saying that children are somehow perfect or innocent or pure. But Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God belongs to people who come to him like little children, who come to him empty handed. The rich young man came to Jesus in totally the wrong way. Look at how he addresses Jesus. Teacher. To be sure, Jesus taught as no one else has ever taught before or since. But he's much, much more than that. But the rich young man comes to him as teacher, looking for him to impart a bit of religious advice. What good deed must I do to have eternal life? How would it have been if he'd come to Jesus not as teacher, but as Lord and Saviour? His question then wouldn't have been, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? But how can I receive? eternal life? And the answer would have been very different. Who can be saved? It's impossible with man. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot earn eternal life. We can't work our way into the kingdom of heaven. But with God, all things are possible. This passage is the first of three in our series. And in the third, Jesus explains how he came to this earth to give his life as a ransom for many. That's how God brings eternal life, through Jesus dying so that we can receive eternal life. That is how eternal life is possible with God. Well, verse 27, then Peter said in reply, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Now, this isn't Peter saying, look at what we've given up. Surely we've earned eternal life. That's not what's going on at all. But Peter is saying, is what we've given up worth it? And maybe you're asking something similar, particularly if putting your trust in Jesus has involved going against the wishes of your family or has been damaging to your career or has been costly in other ways. Jesus gives particular assurances to his disciples and then says, verse 29, Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Whatever you have to give up in receiving the eternal life that Jesus gives, it is worth it. More than worth it. You will receive a hundredfold. A hundred times back anything that you've given up and inherit eternal life. Whatever you have to give up in receiving the kingdom of heaven will be more than recompensed in what you receive. Others may regard you as crazy. In the world's eyes, you may be last. But Jesus says to you that the last will be first. When Jesus returns, you will receive eternal life. That is of infinite value. You'll receive in full what you could never have earned. The eternal life that Jesus gives is worth it. Do you believe that? Will you live that? Not trying to earn eternal life, but receiving it as a gift. And counting everything that you may have to give up as worth it for the sake of the eternal life 
that Jesus gives. Well, let me pray for us. Our loving Lord Jesus, we thank you for these encounters recorded in your word. We thank you for your explanations to your disciples that, that are there for us. We praise you that though we could never possibly earn this eternal life, no good deed would ever secure it for us. We praise you and we thank you that we can receive this eternal life as a gift from you. We praise you that you came to give your life as a ransom for many. And we pray that whatever it is that we have to give up for your sake as we uh, keep hold of this eternal life that you have uh, freely given to all who trust you, we pray that we may count it as infinitely worth it. And we ask this in your precious name and for your sake. Amen. Our closing song reflects on how precious the gift of Jesus and the eternal life that he gives are. Uh, do introduce it from the web page or from your service sheet before singing the closing song.